All right, so I um, hope everybody can see the PowerPoint presentation. We're gonna be moving back and forth between PowerPoint and demo. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of us on. We've got a few from Forge Rock here. Um, myself, Kelvin Brewer, I manage the public sector sales engineering team for Forge Rock. We have James Hostelli who will be, he's a, a senior sales engineer and he'll be presenting the Forge Rock side of the demo. And then um, I have George uh, Hesch from Periton and he will be um, showing the Periton side of the demo and presenting a few of the slides as well. For an agenda, we'll go through the company backgrounds on Forge Rock and Periton just uh, real briefly. And then we'll talk to um, the different modules that we're gonna be showing today that apply to the use cases that um, the Zero Trust group asked for us to address. Um, we'll talk about the deployment requirements for Forge Rock, um, which also uh, apply to the use cases and go through some of the functional areas that we address in the, um, in the Zero Trust architecture um, and talk about some of the integration areas that, that we work with. And then we're gonna go um, into some architecture scoping, talking through the um, uh, how we actually deployed this demo environment um, between us and Periton. We'll uh, talk a little bit about the 853 mappings where our functionality applies there, some differentiators in the technology that you're gonna be seeing and how the licensing works. And, and we'll briefly go through some current customers. Um, the demo is gonna be scattered throughout. So we'll be going back and forth between PowerPoint and demo. At Forge Rock, um, you know, we, we came together as an identity company uh, about uh, 12 years ago. And one of the things that we've um, uh, really focused on is the ability to apply identity to a very flexible marketplace uh, with needs. And in government, it's been very applicable to a lot of different use cases. Um, you know, we really focus on being able to not only apply a, a strong identity um, feature set, but also work with and cooperate with other technologies to augment what Forge Rock does. And so we work uh, with a large partner ecosystem that we'll show you, as well as a large uh, um, SI ecosystem to uh, deploy our, our functionality. Uh, this is a, um, an explanation of the, the different areas where Forge Rock applies. Um, we cover uh, functionality in the access management space, which you'll be seeing a lot of today. We also uh, work in the identity management space, the lifecycle management um, in that area, and um, identity governance with access review and access request, which we won't be touching on today. Uh, and then also in the background, you're gonna, uh, always in the background of Forge Rock is our universal directory in LDAP. Um, and you can also use that as a standalone LDAP as well. Um, you'll, we won't address that directly, but it, it is in the background. Uh, all the time. And then um, tying it all together, uh, Forge Rock has been focused on, and we'll talk a little bit about this and how it applies to your use cases, but Forge Rock has been focused on applying uh, machine learning, um, artificial intelligence to the processes around access and identity management. This is the trust network that we have built out at Forge Rock, other technologies that we work with, the different categories that we address. And one of the things to notice here is that um, with these, uh, with this trust network, it's not only that we say, hey, we have a cooperation with this organization, but the important thing here is we also have worked with these companies to build an integration with the Forge Rock technology so that um, our open source in Git is the ability to download the integration code so that, um, and it's, so that you don't have to try and uh, you know, re-architect the, the integration there. And also the strength of that is that um, we work with as new versions come out of Forge Rock or new versions of those technologies come out, we work with those organizations to keep that integration up to date. Now talking about the zero trust architecture, one of the things to note here is that um, you know, some of these areas in the uh, in the different pillars, uh, we address these things as as a support part of Forge Rock. Like, for example, the ability to produce logs out of Forge Rock. Um, 
you know, we're not a SIM, but we can produce logs out of Forge Rock to uh, feed into a SIM, of course. Um, and the area that we mainly apply to is with the, uh, is of course the user pillar. But then we also have areas because of the AIML stuff that we're doing um, around the uh, threat score and risk score area we'll be talking about, the artificial intelligence areas. And we also, of course, provide APIs that are self-generating. So we have a very flexible schema that allows you to create APIs that self-generate as you uh, extend our schemas. And this all gives you the ability to create a lot of flexibility around supporting even things in the other different columns within the Zero Trust framework. And you'll be able to see some of that in the demo that we showed today, as well as um, one of the things that's really important to address here is that, you know, the, as you, if you see things you're interested in, of course, reach out to us because we'd love to show you more. For the Forge Rock uh, demo that you're going to be seeing today, this is a, uh, a base diagram of how we deployed this. There's some things that I want to uh, really point out here. One is the, the core demo environment is deployed out on GCP. We have a lot of flexibility with our deployment model and we'll talk more about that, but um, we deployed this in the Forge Rock Identity Cloud, which is our um, uh, SaaS solution. And we also have the ability to deploy out to Google Cloud Platform or AWS or Azure as a, in a virtual private cloud. And that is um, how Periton has deployed their Forge Rock instance in AWS GovCloud, um, where they have Forge Rock running and they're working with a couple partner technologies with, with Accuant um, to show some of the functionality that they're going to show related to the Forge Rock uh, de deployments. And then we have the, the instances between Periton and uh, the Forge Rock demo instance federated, and we'll, we'll show you uh, some of the benefits of that and uh, some of the things that that provides for us. And I'll, I'll turn the time over to, to George now for, uh, to talk a little bit more about Periton. Do we have you on, George? I am on mute. I am so sorry. So That's good morning, okay. everyone. <laughs> um, I'm not turning on the video, and you'll see why for the uh, demonstration that I have my camera being uh, pointed at a keyboard, which is not very useful uh, for this presentation. But the Periton name itself has gone through a number of corporate changes. My heritage with Periton actually goes back to the days of EDS, which eventually was acquired by HP. HP split to HP, HPE. HPE spun off their enterprise service to join CSC to form DXC Technology, who then spun off the US public sector group to merge it with two companies that formed Perspecta in 2018. And then last year, Perspecta was acquired by Periton, who just completed their acquisition of Northrop Grumman IT about six months prior. Um, so I, I will say her, heritage wise, we've been in the federal government space for a really long time, handling some of their toughest uh, uh, mission systems problems. And um, I'm here to talk about some of the capabilities that we've done as uh, Heritage uh, EDS that we've been able to provide PIV and CAT credentials to the federal government trusted workforce for, well, 20 years if you include CAC and probably about 15 if you're looking at GSA US access. So that really provides the basis of our expertise to address ATARC's last use case, use case number five. That is a remote user accessing corporate applications and data using a personal device. I kind of rephrased use case five and started asking the question of how do I provide ICAM services for people who do not qualify for a paper crack credential and using personal devices? And that question really corresponds to OMB policy, specifically section five for improving digital interactions with the American public, the memorandum 1917 for enabling mission uh, delivery through improved identity credential and access management. Next slide, please. All right. So this slide, we're talking about some of the specific tools that are residing in the AWS GovCloud environment. Uh, the Forge Rock Access Management instance is running on 
uh, EKS. And we have it, uh, just one instance there, uh, we were deploying it with four jobs, all right? That system actually then communicates with an identity verification service provider. This is a Accuant Connects product. And they're really a moder FedRAMP moderate service for identity assurance level two remote identity proofing capability. And when we complete identity proofing, we bind the proofed identity to uh, an authenticator. In this case, we're using the YubiKey 5 series authenticator. Next slide, please. Okay. The components are pretty much this. On the right-hand side is a description of our authentication tree developed by Paraton. Java is used to create the custom node communicating with Acuance cloud service. Um, if you notice back at Fordrock talks about their identity ecosystem, Acuant is not one of their identity partners at this, at this point in time. So Paraton decided to build our own custom connector on top of the Fordrock interface. All right. And then the other things that we've done is we created uh, business logic in our authentication tree to bind the YubiKey authenticator to the verified identity. We'll also show in our demonstration how biometrics is used for step up authentication. And in the background, having done some work for an independent federal agency with 20 million uh, citizens customers to their web portal, I've learned uh, that we had to keep track of audit records of how we did the identity proofing, as well as what kind of an authenticator is assigned to the individual. Okay, on the left-hand side is a description of the Android mobile app that we built using software developer kits from Fordrock and Acuant. And in our demonstration scenario, we assume that the citizen is bringing their own YubiKey. And I have a little picture of uh, one that I'll be using today. All right. So now we're gonna jump into the demo. So hang on. I probably ought to describe what I'm gonna be demoing. <laughs> All right. So um, the first demo is, is focusing on use case five, as I described earlier. I have a second demo that will show how we do attribute-based access control with identity federation with a phishing resistant MFA to AWS management console and GovCloud. You should note that GovCloud today, you cannot use a YubiKey to authenticate an administrator. So I've, we've built an identity federation connection between our Forge Rock instance in AWS and connected to AWS IAM. And you'll see that as a second demo. And then I will continue on with auto federation between the Forge Rock instance that we have in AWS GovCloud over to the uh, instance that um, is in Google Cloud and um, James will be helping me with that because it was something that they threw at me yesterday afternoon as we were doing our practice. So let me show you my screen. Okay, I assume everyone can see my screen. If you notice, um, basically you're looking at my desktop view. So you can see all my handling around with the mobile device. Uh, the Yubi keys and whatever I'm doing from the keyboard um, is real. So this is the phone here. Just to let you know, when I swing back and forth, you notice the picture of the phone is going back and forth. All right. So um, I'm trying to eliminate any suspected trickery here. All right. So we have a secure portal just for the demonstration purposes. So I am going to create an account. All right. So part of creating the account, I'm just going to say for uh, today's theme, it's about zero trust. So let's go with zero. My last name is trust. I'm lazy. My uh, username is going to be ZT. And um, I'll show you an example here of, let's say, D3M0 capital A T A R C. And you can see uh, how it looks there. Then I'll confirm it on the bottom, D3M0ARC. That looks like it matches. And really, for the most part, we only need the, this password in order to create the account because when I, once I bind it to the YubiKey, you won't be needing that uh, password anymore. All right. 
So this says that the account's been created. So now what I'm gonna do is open up the Android app. All right, and it's about setting up the passwordless account at this point. Username CT, D3M0, capital A, T A R C. All right, and then I should just log in. And it says my session is timed out. Well, that's not good. Okay, that's better. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to set up my passwordless account. And here's we give a little bit of instructions that first we're going to verify the identity. And then we'll set you up with the preferred security key. So let's start with step uh, the first phase. To verify the identity, we give you a number of choices. You can do a photo ID. This will be things like your driver's license, state identification card. Um, I've actually tested it with my son who had a temporary uh, driver's license to try it out and it worked with that as well. Uh, the passport photo is the one page of the passport where you have your photo, the MRZ lines on the bottom, machine receivable zone code. Uh, for today, I am gonna do it with the passport chip. I think that's gonna be a little different than most of the traditional um, uh, Kate, know your customer, anti-money laundering uh, services that are also out there uh, globally. So I picked the passport chip. So I'm gonna show you how I do with the expiration date. And I'm gonna show you that it's gonna error out because I'm just gonna accept today's date, all right? So you can see that. And then based on uh, legal's comments to me about my app, they asked me not to uh, um, share my uh, passport number or my date of birth. So I'm just gonna slide that over temporarily. And I'm gonna enter in my passport number. And then I'm gonna go to my date of birth. I gotta scroll down to my year, much older than I care to admit. Okay, let's go over to the month and find the date. All right, so I have all the information there. Remember, I use today's date as the expiration date, which is completely wrong. So I have my passport over on this side. So when we do the, we have instructions. We find that it works better when you go to the back side. And if you see on the bottom, it says it did not match. Let me put my passport down temporarily. Let's correct the date. Uh, the expiration date is 27 November 15th. Okay, same thing at the back of the passport. Okay, now we advance forward. So the passport chip's been verified and now I'm gonna move to the, uh, letting the application take my selfie. All right, so it's saying to take the picture. And I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Takes a picture, I'm gonna accept it. And let's see if I pass. Okay, it says looks good. I finished the verification. Okay, now I'm on to step two, binding a YubiKey to my verified identity. So in this case, I am gonna use this key here. It's a hard security key. I accept getting started. I select the bottom of use security key with the USB. So I insert it in the bottom here. Okay, you see it flashed, it's asking me to accept it. I say, okay, hopefully you see the flashing right there. If not, wait for the touch. Okay, so we found that this 
uh, it's done. So it's completed. So I go back to my web browser. And now I'm going to log it back into uh, the Fordrock as a Denny provider. So I said my user ID was ZT. I've got the hard token in place. It says to get started. Now, what happens is, is the Fortrock platform recognizes the account. It's all set up. It does not register a device with my account as of yet. So this is the first time I'm using the mobile device. It's going to uh, scan for my photo as part of a step of authentication process. There we go. So I say start camera, scroll up, take another selfie, submit the photo. Oh, it didn't like my photo. One of those days, let's move it closer. Wow, let's do this. Come back in. Security key. Search security key. Okay. Oh, okay, I made it through. All right, so they saw that I, um, after my identity was verified, I bound the security key uh, to my identity. I come back to the web portal. It didn't recognize the device being associated with my user ID. So it had me do a step up authentication using um, my face recognition that was collected during the registration process. So I'm gonna sign out sign back in this time it should not it should recognize the fact that this device is registered with my user id and it should not ask me for a photo this time so i'm just straight into the uh, portal application okay so i'm going to step out of this so that was demo one and I am going to turn off the webcasting for the phone. I don't need this anymore. And just focus on the second part of the demo is showing how we've integrated Fordrock with um, AWS and GovCloud. All right. So I have two administrator keys with YubiKeys on them. One is green, one is blue. I'm going to use um, the green one, just because it's easier to see the, uh, the signal light when I turn it on. So let me bring up my web browser here. Okay, so you can see, um, let me see. I suppose I should shrink this a little bit so you can kind of see both. All right, so I'm gonna log in with a user. Uh, sorry, wrong user. Admin green, I've got a hard token. So I'm gonna stick it in the port of this PC. Selfie, you see it flashing. It's quite good for me to touch it. All right. 
All right, so the connection to the AWS um, Management Console is this application. All right, so the first thing you should notice that this is AWS GovCloud. I'm in the GovCloud West region. This is some information about my identity. It says it's a federated login. Okay, and then um, I'm gonna pick an AWS service. Uh, for the purposes here, we're gonna do Secrets Manager. Okay, and you can see that we have two secrets in the system. At one is for Project Green and one's for Project Blue. So since I logged in as the green administrator, I'm gonna to attempt to access or look at the secrets for Project Blue. So it is what you would expect. I don't really have the permissions to go see what's in Project Blue. All right, you have the error message here and the secret detail is kind of empty. So now let's go back to the secrets and, and then we'll look at Project Green. All right, so now we have some of the secrets detailed here. Um, you can see that I can come down to secrets value. It's really plain text, nothing's cryptographically uh, complicated here. Um, but then I do wanna point out that the tag field here is how we assign attributes to which administrators have privilege to certain kinds of things. In this case, um, I have the green value is the attribute that we're sharing between Forge Rock over to the AWS Management Console. Okay, so I'm pretty much done with that part of the demo. All right, and let's just come back to you. This main one. So James, I hope you're on. Um, I'm going to now go over from the project console is what's going to do auto federation between the Forge Rock instance that Periton has set up in the AWS GovCloud over to what Forge Rock has set up in GCP. Yeah, I'm here, George. So uh, All right. I, I can support you. <laughs> Guide me through this. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, <laughs> what we witnessed was George, you know, doing a IAL2 strong registration and tying a UDP device uh, to his account in Fordrock. Uh, and now what we have is we have a, uh, a circle of trust set up between our environment and GCP and their environment, in AWS GovCloud. And we're just presenting the user with, with a basic splash page so we can kind of choose our journey and, and you'll see why um, when we get to the demo later. But for now, George is going to pick the Periton account because he wants to use his credentials, which are in AWS GovCloud, but they do not exist yet in our environment. So as the service provider, we're going to do just-in-time provisioning here. So we're going to ask him, would he like to create an account? We're going to say yes. And then he's going to uh, associate a password to his account. And then later, we could get rid of that password and tie it to a UV key. At the same time, <clears throat> what we have is uh, a password checker. Um, that's not only mean the complexity of, of our environment, but we're actually doing an API call out to a password service where we can you know, look for uh, uh, bad passwords, known bad passwords, common passwords, those kind of things. So he's just going ahead and creating his account here. Uh, you can set up a, a KBA question. Uh, and then once his account is created, because we provision him on the service provider side, next time he, he'll be presented with a different journey, which I can show you later. Uh, and that will determine you know, how he wants to authenticate, whether it's using a password, uh, multi-factor authentication, uh, maybe a one-time passcode to email, um, you know, pick and choose your flavor. And so, uh, Oh. Unless you want to, I only got one choice. All right, and share the knowledge. Yeah, that's all customizable. We just set it up so that uh, you would do, uh, you know, maybe one security question, and then all right. obviously terms and conditions. Oh, wow! Well. You're not using an incognito window. In rehearsal, we use the incognito window, and it all worked. 
But if you want, you can you can switch it over back to Calvin. We can explain this journey and we can walk through it a little bit more. Okay. All right. Kelvin, I'm going to stop sharing, let you come back presenting. All right, is everybody able to see my screen? Yep. All right. <clears throat> So we talked a little bit about this, the uh, different deployment models for Forge Rock. And I, just before I go into this, I just want to, you know, Periton's done a great job of showing how you can extend Forge Rock into other uh, functionality, um, complementing the, the Forge Rock technology. They've done a lot of innovative work uh, for some agencies within the federal government. And, uh, you know, Georgia did a great job showing some of the uh, uh, advantages that that has provided. Uh, especially for those use cases where it's uh, somebody trying to access um, information over a browser or over their mobile phone where they, in, in some cases, can't use a PIV or a CAT card. Um, <clears throat> we still have, uh, you know, Fordrock, one of the things that we've really focused on is, is having a flexible deployment model. And so, you know, we have a, a Fordrock um, identity cloud where we have a, a subscription as a service, and it's it's not FedRAMP yet. We're working on that. Um, but we also um, have deployments, and this is where we're deployed most in the federal government, uh, into virtual private clouds, uh, in GovCloud. Um, we have uh, stuff running in IL-5, IL-6 type environments, and that can be deployed either with traditional um, uh, installers or, and this is what George talked about with Forge Ops, it can be deployed with pre-built um, Kubernetes scripts and uh, in a containerized model. And it can be deployed to any cloud. We have uh, workloads running in uh, AWS, Azure Google Cloud, uh, Oracle Cloud. Um, we're very flexible in that respect. As long as it's Kubernetes compliant, you can deploy out the, the product over uh, DevOps um, and then it's fully extensible and um, allows you to scale uh, the way you would a cloud deployment. So talking about um, NIST 800-53 Rev4, um, we've identified some of the categories where Fordrock does meet the controls. Um, and, and one of the things that's you know important here is, you know, we, I didn't want to throw up a big spreadsheet showing how Fordrock meets each control. But one of the things that's important here is that um, is that uh, an identity and access management solution does provide um, uh, a broad number of controls in, in the 853 model. And um, you know, we, if, if you're interested in looking into Fordrock more, we can uh, share with you exact mappings. But you know, one of the things that's important there is that this is an essential piece of, of meeting the um, risk management frameworks uh, and NIST 800-53 is having a solid identity and access management solution. And it, you know, when you're speaking of zero trust, it specifically, um, it's uh, in my one of the things that I always like to say is identity is the security perimeter, and that is, you know, that's the door of how people get in or how devices get in. And so that's what's really important about having a solid solution around identity and access management is that to truly build a, a zero trust model with that trust, but consistently verify, you need to have the ability to um, uh, have flexible um, user uh, authentication and authorization journeys. Uh, and, and not only applying to users, but also devices um, so that you can um, manage things in a way that is easy to uh, modify, easy to change, easy to um, adjust as different technologies come out, as different ways of doing things. You know, and a, and a, a prime example is what's happening in the world with, um, with uh, the decentralized identity, where, you know, we, in the federal government, we've really embraced the federated user model. And that's probably not going away anytime soon, 
but states are moving towards the decentralized identity model where, you know, support some of what George was showing where you're using um, uh, bring your own identity, where it's maybe your driver's license or your passport or something like that with facial ID. And um, how do we interoperate with those and how do we adjust to being able to um, work with those? And that's where Forge Rock's ability to orchestrate journeys gives you that flexibility so that you can do things like um, uh, apply different models, different identity models, different authentication and authorization models to uh, to journeys. And James is really going to show how you can say, well, we're going to federate, but we're also going to require other authentication, step up authentication at different places. And it may be, you know, it may be AL2, it may be AL3, you know, you just, you can decide how you want to, um, in the 863 model, you can decide how you want to, uh, what you want to enforce based on what the user is trying to do, uh, matching that zero trust concept. And so Forgerox built out these orchestration journeys and James is gonna show you these, but the important thing is with these journeys is the flexibility of being able to adapt to what needs to be happening for that specific circumstance in, in authentication. And this is a, a short video showing um, the ability to change an authentication journey uh, easily to adapt to new requirements. And you know, one of the things that you can see here is it's a drag and drop model it allows you to take what we call them nodes, these little pieces here that you're seeing, um, nodes and add a step to your authentication journey. Um, you're easy, easily able to orchestrate that and build it in and deploy it out. And you can associate it, and James will show you more of this. You can associate it with different themes. You can associate so that you have different login experiences for the users, authentication experiences, where it's branded to whatever the agency needs. Uh, for that circumstance, as well as, um, you know, you can test these out very easily uh, where, you know, we give you the, the IP address for being able to test it really quickly and deploy it out. And the important thing here is, of course, is the ability to fine tune so that you have um, the multi-dimensional runtime decisioning. And just, you know, we're talking about the different AL3 levels uh, where you're adding in the ability to be contextual and adaptive. And, and so, you know, you do that initial authentication, but that doesn't mean the user's trusted for whatever they're trying to get to. It means that they've shown that they have the credentials, whether that's a YubiKey, whether that's, uh, um, you know, using some other passwordless method, uh, or it's maybe a username and password, or it's a cat card or PIV card whatever it was that they used to authenticate in with you know, their PIN number, whatever. Um, then as they go in to try and get into different applications, you have that transactional authorization. And that transactional authorization might be that you know, within that transactional authorization that, they're, um, that they are needing to do a step up, or maybe they need to do some identity proofing. Whatever it may be, that transactional authorization to get to that app um, is you can put in there. And then of course, each time they try and change uh, activities, maybe you don't do anything because they've already assured at a high enough level, but maybe you do, maybe you require them to add in different types of, um, you know, different authentication steps uh, or step up auth authorizations, um, depending on uh, what you're trying, what they're trying to get to. Maybe they're trying to get to something that's still an on-premise software suite or a mainframe. And so then it's going to go through a reverse proxy like for drugs at any gateway. Um, and you're going to change it from, you know, a, an OAuth token to a, a header auth or forms auth type of a methodology. And those steps here are all represented to say, maybe we need to do something different to get to that specific application. And that means we need to do some different kind of authorizations. And so um, what we're giving you is this tree-based service flows, but it doesn't just apply to authentication and authorization. It also applies to user registration. It applies to password resets. It applies to um, you know, forgotten usernames, progressive profiling, which is a really important theme, especially when you're talking about citizen facing, where you're looking at um, needing to gather information from the citizens, not just about who they are, but also about what they need access to and why they need access and what their interests are um, so that you can present to them the kind of user experience that the, um, that the average um, uh, citizen is expecting. And so that progressive profiling says, well, maybe on the first time they register, we're gonna gather this set of data. 
But later, maybe on the third login, we'll ask them for a little more. And on the fifth login, maybe we'll ask them a couple more questions and just over time gather information from them. And so now I'm going to turn the time over to James. He's going to go through the um, Fordrock side of the demo a little bit with Periton. And then, um, and then we'll come back to wrap it up and address any questions that anybody has. Thanks, Kelvin. Let me uh, just go ahead and share out my screen here and let me know when everyone can see. We got it. We can see. Excellent. <clears throat> so uh, what you're looking at now, we're going to kind of talk a little bit about the, the Fordrock platform, the administrative side of things, how we can uh, provide that orchestration layer for different user journeys or authentication methods. Um, as well as maybe identity proofing or registration flows. So I'm just going to go ahead and log in here. And we are now logged into the Fordrock platform in uh, GCP. And you'll notice uh, we give you some dashboards out of the box. There's, there's more coming, right? Um, but you can actually see trends. You can see your users. You can see successful journeys and failures, which we'll get to. So we, we provide the ability to, you know, to export these logs, to uh, send them to your, your BI tools of choice, make different dashboards. I do have a sample here for Splunk. So we actually created a Splunk dashboard where you can provide some, some additional information. So you could tie this to your identity cloud instance or your on-prem instance, and you can gather um, you know, these type of logins or, you know, this, the, the different metrics, right, that are uh, of concern. And you can see here, we actually can capture uh, activity logs from different locations. I was kind of bouncing around on VPN to show you the difference and you can see your activity by country, right? So here's a nice dashboard that, you know, you can have tied with the identity cloud. We have this feature here for applications. This is how you can easily set up different applications with uh, uh, OAuth or uh, OIDC. Um, you can see we've got ServiceNow, or you can set up uh, an application to any bill of SaaS offering or anyone that supports uh, OIDC or SAML. And then we do have this concept of hosted pages. And I just want to touch on this a little bit. This is a uh, we give you the ability to do some branding out of the box. So, you know, when you see that single sign on page and you want to present a theme to your users, you can create different themes. And then these themes can be tied to uh, different journeys. And they could also be decided dynamically based on the user's attribute or maybe uh, what organization they belong to. So, you can have multiple themes that are tied to either organizations or even to journeys. Uh, and what's really nice is, you know, we kind of, you can provide a little background, we give you, you know, set up your signing card and you can change things. So this is the theme that I set up for, you know, today's demo. Uh, and then you also have a theme around the end user UI, right? So uh, me as a user, uh, this is the end user, U user, user UI that we provide. But you can also customize this uh, and we provide you, you know, the open source um, bits needed so you can have your own look and feel. But what's really nice is we give you the capability to uh, expose, you know, what your end user can see. So should he be allowed to see his, uh, his um, two-step verification and what devices, right? What trusted devices? Are they allowed, should he be allowed to remove those trusted devices? Uh, maybe we wanna let him manage his security questions. And so I can easily put a checkbox here and now these security questions would become available where I could reset them. Um, maybe I don't want him to allow to reset his password. Maybe he needs to go through the help desk or some, some other type of process, right? So you can easily provide these different preferences around consent and even GDPR controls, right? So around your, your data, what data does this uh, organization have of me? Would I like to remove my account uh, and even share that information, right? So we provide those capabilities out of the box for the end user pages, end user pages. And like I said, you can have multiple, multiple themes. 
and you'll see here, we give you a starter theme, right? And then you can kind of go from there and customize as you will. Uh, and so what you're looking at, this is the platform UI, right? And so what we did is we took a mix between our access management and identity management, and we blended it into a single, single U, UI interface. Uh, we build the APIs first, and then we build the UI on top, which allows you the capability to build your own UIs around the administrative as well as the end user. And if you look at my identities here, you can see I can easily go ahead and manage different users. Um, you'll see here uh, some of the users that are already listed, and we could go through and kind of look at their profile and you know see what organizations they belong to. And what I would like to touch on is the uh, hierarchical structure that you can build this out. So right now we're in a single realm called Alpha, and you can have multiple realms. Realms are a logical separation between organizations or uh, environments. So the Alpha realm would not talk to, say, the Bravo realm, uh, and different users would exist in each one. Same thing with your applications and your policies. Uh, and we want to manage, you can see here, I have different assignments, I could have different roles, but we have organizations. And you'll see here, I created an org called Org Model One. And if I was to click on it, then I can actually see who the administrator is. And this is that concept of delegated administration. And you can have uh, an organization and sub organizations. You can have uh, super users and super administrators. And you can actually have uh, members of that organization. So you'll see that these three are members. And if I was to log in as the administrator, I can actually manage those users. So I'll go through a journey, log in, and you'll be able to see that. And I could easily go to here and maybe create a new organization if I wanted to. And you'll see, you'll get the option. Is there a parent organization? Maybe mod one is the parent. I could easily add an administrator or members, right? Uh, and then now I want to talk about really is uh, journeys, right? So journeys- James, real, real yes, quick, one, one point that I wanted to make on organizations just really quickly before you jump into journeys is that the, the organizations also allow you to provide a way to do delegated administration. So when you have a, a organization set up and you assign administrators, when the administrators log into their portal, what they're going to be able to do is edit the, the objects that you've given them permission to edit, whether that's users or roles or assignments. And they can go in and, uh, you know, based on the permissions they have, they could possibly create new users. They could possibly um, update users, delete users or roles or assignments or whatever those uh, objects may be. And that the power of that, um, has has really helped a lot of uh, you know complex organizations, including you know could apply to federal agencies where they where you have a, a complex um, set of sub agencies. Um, this org model helps with being able to, um, as James is showing there, being able to then um, pare down what people can do as uh, delegated admins, as well as make that management so that you can do that in one single instance, uh, so that you can have all of your users centered in one place. Yep, and as I'm going through right now, I'm just creating a user, or user one. Since I am a delegated admin, I'm allowed to create them. And you can see here, I can actually manage these different users, their profiles. I can reset their password if needed. So that was just me logging in as the administrator for org one, which was ATARC one. And so now I'm gonna jump over to journeys, right? So we talked about, uh, you saw George, he had a really nice journey set up around um, identity proofing and, and registration. And I'm just gonna show you how easy it is to orchestrate those journeys um, that even provide those complex uh, interactions between a user or adding multi-factor authentication. Uh, and you can see here, if I wanted to, I can apply a different theme to those journeys. So we talked about the themes. There's the ATARC theme, which is the default. I can just apply a different theme if I want. 
Uh, and then you can actually add additional tags so you can organize your, your journeys and they're really easy to see and follow. And so I'm just going to create one here called test 12 and we'll just start out with uh, a username and a password. Um, and uh, we also gave you the capability. So Kelvin touched on the data store. We have our data store underneath the covers, right? Which is where the user needs to exist. So that would be our data store decision. But what if you wanted to leverage multiple data stores? We give you the capability to maybe <clears throat> leverage LDAP, right? So it, maybe the user doesn't exist in our data store. We could go look in LDAP, make a decision, and then authenticate them and pass them through. But for this, we also, instance, we also support pass through authentication in that same way as well. Yes, we do. And that could be where we um, just do pass through authentication, uh, verify their password and credentials, and we pass them on. Or we could actually uh, do a patch where we could create the user's account based on the pass through authentication and the hash password. And then the next time they come around, they will be uh, residing in our data store. So you can easily see you have this uh, panel and we have all these nodes over here on the left-hand side. And you can just drag and drop, connect dots and we created a journey on the fly. Um, you'll see here is the URL. I'm just gonna copy this and open up another browser here. And I'm gonna paste that journey and you'll see instantly I'm presented with a username. Oops. And it's gonna want my password. And I'm in. But what now? <clears throat> so that was real simple, right? Username and password. Let's go ahead and just modify that journey. And in real time, we will just put a, a page node here because this is, say, a collection of the items. So we'll do a username and password. Um, and then we'll do the data store. And if I hit save, you'll instantly see that my user experience will change. And, in real time, now I have username and password on the same page. But what if we want to add a little more complexity? So we could add CAPTCHA, maybe search for see if it's a robot, um, and we you know have to provide our site key. But what I actually have, we have a concept called inner trees where we can leverage existing journeys. So I'm just going to use an inner tree here, and you'll see here that I actually have one already created called CAPTCHA, and that just has the pre-populated information. And so now I'm just gonna connect the dots here, hit save, and what's gonna happen is I will have a new experience where I leveraged a journey I already created, and should be prompted with CAPTCHA before even going anywhere. Right. So instantly I just <clears throat> added, you know, a little complexity by simply dragging, uh, you know, the drag and drop node, right? Uh, as I go through, now I want my username and password. Now we can actually change the journey a little more using the concept of inner trees, or we could say, let's add an MFA preference, right? So you can see here we have um, groupings, right? Whether you want a one-time password or OAuth, uh, SMS, we can support all those different factors, uh, WebAuthN, which I'll show you. And then if we look here, you know, you could even add risk, uh, behavioral analytics, uh, federation, right? Um, so we have lots of different nodes. And so a lot of these are in the marketplace or they can be customized. You can make them yourself. But what I want to do now is I want to jump back to that journey that uh, George was using that we created for this demonstration. So if I look at ATARC, because I, I, I flagged it, this is the login that we're all going to, right? The federated login. And I'm just going to open this up to kind of show you the complexity behind the scenes, but how easy it was to make this, right? So um, 
I left it all broken out because I wanted you to see the various steps that we can take as we travel through these journeys, but these could all be easily combined into uh, an inner tree. And you'll notice here, um, when we get to the stage of AL1, 2, or 3, 3 being web off, that I'm actually using an inner tree. And if I wanted to see what that would look like, you can click on my little button and you'll see here, I'm just leveraging a web off tree that I already have created. And if I wanted to, we could actually just add that web off to my existing tree. And what's gonna happen is instantly that tree that I just created called test, I'm gonna add that web off entry on the end here. And I'm um, gonna say web off. And I'm gonna just call it web off so you guys can see. And what's gonna happen is now I'm gonna be uh, prompted for web off end. And I hit save and I'll come back, bring up my, my new window over here. And we can go through capture again. Let's find some chimneys. Let me know if I miss one here. Okay. One. And now it's actually prompting me for my web auth end device. And now I just authenticated. So instantly I went from username and password to bot detection on the front end and a second factor authentication using web auth by just dragging and dropping these different nodes into the journey. So now I'm gonna take you through that federated login where we are doing uh, just-in-time provisioning. And this is what George wanted to show. So uh, you can see here, we're gonna present it with a choice. We can come through and if the account doesn't exist, uh, we can go ahead and we will actually create it. We will provision it create the object. And you'll notice here, as you traverse the journey, I have risk involved, right? So uh, depending on how a user is authenticated, depending on his attributes, his membership, you can add different authentication levels. And those authentication levels can be tied to policies that are protecting your applications. Um, and you can you know, invoke things around uh, device risk or uh, maybe geolocation, right? Maybe you, um, uh, you know, want to set up geofencing around maybe just the, the US perimeter or something, right? Uh, and then we can uh, invoke MFA if they exceed that uh, geofencing, those kind of things. So I'm going to take you through these three different journeys and you'll notice, depending on my decision here, they're going to travel different paths. Uh, one of them, you'll just get authenticated, and, uh, but you won't get any authentication level. So you're not going to end up at the, the end user UI. But if we choose, say, push authentication or web auth N, then we will uh, have a higher authentication level and we'll end up at the web user interface. Kelvin, if I'm uh, missing anything or if you want to interject, feel free. So I'm just gonna go through this journey. And what I'm gonna show you is we're actually gonna go to Paraton. And a user exists over there, um, but not in our instance. So I just wanna go show you real quick. If we look at our users, I'm gonna use FRLB2, which does not exist in the Fordrock platform. Uh, so I'm gonna click next, and this is gonna redirect me to the Periton instance up here, which is in AWS. Now the user does exist on their end. Is we're gonna do uh, federation. What's gonna happen is, now you're seeing the same uh, similar example that you saw before. So the account does not exist on our end. Would you like to create it? So I will say yes. Password. 
and now my account is created. But you'll see here, I just got redirected and I ended up at ATARC website because that's how I set up this journey, right? I'm gonna come back in and I'm gonna use the same user. And what's gonna happen, cookies, one moment. So I'm gonna say Paraton. <laughs> Clear my cache. Nope, it actually worked. So I got redirected. And I will be and use the right password here. And what should happen now that that account is created and it exists, we are actually going to take a different path. So just to show you what path we're about to take. So no account existed, we went this route. Now the account exists. We're actually gonna get prompted with this AAL choice where I can uh, make different changes, right? And we're just showing you the AL one, two, three choice based on uh, uh, for simplicity. Uh, I need to clear my cache, so sorry. Yeah. Cookies are very sticky and uh, there's no sign out options. <laughs> uh, so we, we set up the AL choice just to show um, the different journeys and make it um, uh, more understandable, but that could be a dynamic decision, right? It could also be based on a user's attributes or even like I said, the device or the geolocation. See if this makes me a liar. There we go. All about cookies. So you can see here, now I am presented with uh, three different choices. Uh, the first one would just be a username and password. Uh, and it's going to do some uh, device profiling. And then it will actually take me to the ATARC website again, because you can see here, it queried my device, it knows my location. And that's just uh, API logic and behind the background. So we have this concept of scripted nodes, where if you can write something in JavaScript or Groovy, you can do all kinds of dynamic and fun things. So here we are. Now I'm going to actually come through and I'm going to be presented with a different option, right? We're going to do the uh, AL2. So we're going to come in as Periton, or even I can come in, I'll come in as Fordrop just to switch it up. Um, so now I'm going to do a uh, talk one. Now I'm just going to use a different user. That account's going to exist. Uh, maybe I want to use, and now we'll do AL2, which in this case is going to be a push notification or possibly an email. For this instance, I'll just do a push. And you get presented with a barcode here because I've never used this account before. So I'm going to use my phone and I'm going to pull up the Fordrock Authenticator app. And you'll see here, it once account successfully registered. And we actually set up this journey so you can have some recovery codes, right? So if you lose your device and you need to get back in, you can have the recovery codes, all optional. And I hit done. And now I have authenticated as a user. And if I look at my profile, you can see here, there's my username. There's my two-step verification. And you can see here, I actually have my push device registered. And the third one I want to show you is going to be around uh, WebAuthn. We kind of went through that already, but um, okay, I can show you that. 
Fair time. And so these orchestration journeys are seeing not only can they be used for um, authentication or biometrics, we can also do that for uh, user registration, which I'll show you, as well as perhaps uh, some type of identity proofing. So you can see here, I now have two devices registered under my user. And just to give you an idea of what a registration flow might look like, you can see here under registration, uh, this could be a new user registration. I touched on uh, this concept of a uh, scripted decision nodes. This is where you add logic to these journeys, where you can either um, query third-party information or do some transformation, apply different logic. Here, I just allow a user to you know, upload a picture of themselves from their camera, but you can see here, uh, we can bring in this logic into the registration process just by dragging and dropping. Uh, I can also do things around maybe identity proofing. So if I wanted to uh, bring in my inner tree, which has uh, identity proofing with Onfido, I can simply connect this and leverage this inner tree which has, you know, uh, submit an application with the, my driver's license. Uh, let's check that information. And then we create the account based on the attributes that we're pulling. And then those attributes can easily be added, such as a uh, telephone, right? And then now that becomes an option when the user is going to register. So you can easily build out these journeys. I have one here for CAC and PIV just to show you that you can leverage. Um, you know, if you want to collect a certificate, validate, check against OCSP, uh, check the CRL. All you do is fill in these different parameters, and then you can enable CAC and PIV as an authentication journey. And with that, um, you know, we have the password policy and email templates, all those things. So all this stuff you, you pretty much get out of the box, forgot username, forgot password, and you can dynamically create these journeys on the fly in real time. Um, they're persisted JSON files, and they can easily be transferable between different environments. So uh, that concludes my part of the demonstration. I'll send it over to Kelvin, unless there's anything you think I missed that I should touch on while I have the screen. I think you're good, James. Thank you. We wanted to touch on just uh, a feature that we have coming out in the next couple of months. Um, this is a, a product that we're calling Autonomous Access. It is an AI ML based uh, risk engine that can um, integrate with a number of different signals to do things like boost fraud prevention, uh, improve customer engagement, um, you know, and then just improve the intelligence of the user journeys. And some of the things that we're focused on with this. Um, <clears throat> is threat prevention, of course, uh, preventing bots, preventing brute force attacks, um, credential stuffing, things like that. Uh, anomaly detection, looking at um, things like the user's location, their normal behavior. And, and you know, one of the things that um, has around the fraud area um, or around uh, the risk of, uh, of government employees, um, you know, becoming uh, uh, antagonistic towards the towards the um, agency, you know, it's a, you look at that behavior and you see that, okay, this group or this user is logging in at a time they usually don't, they're going to high risk applications. And so what do we need to do to um, either add additional step up authentication for them, um, authorize to limit what screens they can see through authorization policy, all done with Fordrock. Um, you know, those, those steps are getting to be more and more important for us to increase security and having an AIML engine that learns in the background.
to be able to capture those things quickly in real time and send alerts and provide um, immediate security controls on what the user's doing is, is just vital to being able to um, uh, being able to secure our, our organizations. And you know the other thing that's important there is, is then providing data. James was showing some of the dashboards and things with the autonomous access. We're also going to be adding in a lot more dashboards and visibility into some of these risk fa factors so that you can see um, down to the user level or to the group level um, what is happening that is increasing risk uh, for your organization. The way for drugs license, this is a lot of text, but just to, to uh, summarize this, the way for drug license is by identity annually. We don't have any surge pricing. We don't um, charge on a monthly number of users type of thing. So if you have a time where a whole bunch of people are, um, are going to be uh, accessing the environment. So let's say it's, uh, you know, like Medicare registration, for example, I know the states deal with that a lot. Um, you know, things uh, like uh, taxes for the IRS, where a bunch of people are logging in to get information uh, during tax filing season. Uh, those kind of surges, um, we don't watch for that. We don't send monthly bills. We do an annual user count uh, licensing model. And, um, and we also don't limit the number of instances that you can have either. So, uh, you know, if, if you're deploying out to virtual private clouds, out to GovCloud, um, we, we provide you the, the um, Kubernetes scripts if you wanna do uh, the DevOps deployments or, or the, the bits to do a straight installment. And you can have as many instances of Fordrock as you want, and there's no limitations on that. It's just, we license on annual users. And we, these are uh, just examples of some of the uh, different licensing packages that we have for the different functionality um, in our intelligent authentication, which is our base access management um, license. Then you also get all the different, uh, the multi-factor type uh, types that we support and things like that. And then we also have these different authorization models and federation packages. Uh, we also have user managed access. And, and we covered uh, a number of these areas today, specifically intelligent access authorization and federation. And then we also talked a little bit about lifecycle and relationship management and self-service. We showed you a little bit of that um, and, uh, and data syncing. We didn't touch on things like social identity and workflow, access request, access review. We didn't go into details about identity gateway though there was some authorization happening. Um, with uh, some different applications. These are, these are common services that everybody gets that aren't licensed. And then if you want to deploy as, as a straight LDAP, then you have the directory services licensing models, um, which we didn't get into details on. And then we also have our micro gateway for microservices support, and we did not go into the details on that either. These are some of the um, federal customers that we have. Um, we have uh, a, a lot of presence in a number of different agencies uh, and also in the Department of Defense. Um, we'll, we'll focus on that, but there'll be a, a um, PDF of this presentation out, in the, out on uh, Huddle for anybody that would like to see it. And I'll turn the time over to George to talk a little bit more about Periton and Close. Okay, hi everyone. All right. So what I did demonstrate was what we built using developer kits, both on the uh, using um, software developer kits uh, on the Android mobile platform, a little bit on the uh, HTML5 capabilities. And obviously we used uh, Java to do our coding for creating the custom nodes on to run on top of Fordrock. Um, and uh, the instance of Fordrock we're using is uh, what they call the cloud developer kit. So what the capabilities that I've shown are what's possible beyond the usual identity as a service offerings that you may get from a number of different competitors in uh, this space. So Periton's offering is deployed as an accelerator kit that we customize and brand um, for our cust uh, federal government customers, all right? So uh, let's move on to the next slide. So these are just a sampling of some of uh, Periton's uh, customers. And then from there, I believe we're on Q and A. Is that right, Kelvin? Yes, we are. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions for us?
All right. Well, thank you everyone for the opportunity to um, walk through Ford Rock and the Periton Solutions. Appreciate your time today. Awesome. I'm going to stop recording.